Welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we sit through philosophy to find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sadler. Today, we're talking about... Truth, society, and the marketplace of ideas. And that's a lot of ideas all kind of thrown in there together, so we're getting a little meta because we're going to have ideas about ideas. We're also continuing what you could call, I guess, a a series that we didn't realize we were going to do as a series. Uh, We started out, what, three episodes back? Yeah, this is four. (laughs) (laughs) We did did one about memory, and it was going to be memory and truth, but we mostly just talked about memory. Mm -hmm. And we we did talk about truth a little bit in that one, didn't we? A little bit, but yeah, it was mostly memory. And then we did more memory and a little bit of truth, and then a lot of truth. So there's there's a lot to these topics. They're they're not quite as simple and straightforward as you might think. And and we're trying to do a good job as well in not getting too abstract, not getting too academic, making sure that there's some reference to our ordinary life and i think in this one perhaps there's a bit more right because we're talking about the society that we live in and how we how we learn what's true we figure out what's false um both in the this is very much the application episode okay we, yeah that's, that's there, there was such a, a deep topic that it took a lot to get to the place where we're actually starting to apply these processes you know, this is a bit off topic, but when I thought through a lot of the the issues and, and problems and subtopics that we're going to talk about here, I got a little dismayed. You know, you think about the society that we live in, and if you if you don't if you're not paying very close attention, you you don't you're not as a, a, attuned to how many ways truth is kept from us or obstacles are set up in the way of acquiring truth. We have people lying to us all the time Mm -hmm. for different reasons. And, you know, we're going to talk about, well, maybe there should be some way for truth to like, will, you know, win out or cut through or something like that. Actually, somebody uh, today on YouTube, one of the comments that was interesting about one of our previous shows, he said that in my country, there's a proverb that lies have short legs, meaning that the truth always catches up to it, right? And then if that was true itself, that would be excellent. But I think there's a lot of times where we we find out, no, the the, the lies actually had long legs or much stronger legs than, than the truth. So I don't know. Did you have any sort of feeling like that as you're thinking about some of these issues? Or are you pretty still optimistic, pretty... Uh, bullish on on truth winning out um no i'm i'm as you are conflicted this is a uh, an issue for the times obviously and we are are grappling with it and we will talk about on a couple of the topics here and how they're different not only like motivations but also just different ways at viewing things that result in people potentially coming to um things that are that they perceive as true but are not true not because they have a negative you know intention Mm -hmm. to actually do that um but because they have been led astray uh or they have come from a certain you know antecedent idea that would lead them away from truth as a, a good to be sought. Yeah. And and now this has some classical antecedents as well. You know, in ancient times, um, in wisdom traditions and philosophical traditions, we see this constant refrain that the human being is not just a rational animal, but an animal that values and desires truth. And so tries to seek it out, that it's better to, you know, have truth, even if the truth kind of is is not 
the, the best uh, in, in what it actually depicts than to be lied to or deceived. And there's also, you know, interesting analyses that would, in ancient philosophy, for example, say, well, why are, why are people, if they are naturally inclined to truth, why are they so often wrong about certain things? And there's a lot of places you could lay blame, you know, the natural attractiveness of objects of desire and pleasure that overwhelm us, um, being children and being immature and getting the wrong messages from adults about how it's so important to have social status and it's less important to worry about the condition of your soul or things like that. But I think we really are in a much more difficult, problematic situation. I don't want to say in modern times, but I want to say in late modern times, particularly with the the internet age where it's not as if you couldn't lie on the you know radio or in newspapers or anything like that but it but it's the flow of communication is just so pervasive now you know the, the idea of having targeted ads think about what that would have been like prior to the internet somebody would have had to have like you know worked up a dossier on you and figured out what your deep desires are uh, based on some psychological generalizations about the sort of things you do and say. And then they'd have to like, you know, maybe clip out parts of the newspaper that applied specifically to you, <laughs> mm-hmm. shove those in your mailbox for you to see the next day. It's like, it feels like the only people that could do that are like the CIA. Yeah, or, or it could be done. I mean, you can maybe pay people to do it if you're a rich person. You know, to yeah. find your special <laughs> ads, but now we're having. But, but to to what benefit? Like the cost would, at least at that point in time, would have greatly outweighed the benefit of doing that. Yeah, it's almost like that would be something in an absurdist piece of literature, right? Because it mm-hmm. it is kind of inconceivable. But now we we inhabit a, a time and culture and, and space where targeted ads are hitting us all the time. And and for you and I who grew up, you know, getting to see the internet develop and begin to pervade our life to the extent that um, it's hard to imagine modern life without it, it's one thing. But I think for people who are, you know, say eight, my, my college students right now, they've grown up with, with that. Um, that is the norm for them. They don't have any, they, they do have um, comparison objects, you know, that can allow them to think about things being differently, but it's history or it's fiction. It's not their experience that they can compare it to. And, you know, what will happen when they're having children, you know, um, Mm -hmm. assuming that the Internet progresses and becomes much more personalized and much more, what would you call it, like data? um, Driven? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's it's interesting because there are definitely – factions within technology or technological groups that are are kind of fighting against that there's a, oh say a something push about that back. yeah um yeah i guess um oh shoot uh i i forget the gentleman's name um but there there have been some several people who have been like okay like the data that you own is um your property and that um that if if companies instead of just getting it for free, um, actually had to pay for it, then there would at least be some sort of monetary exchange for like the yeah. things that we're giving up in exchange. Um, you know, like a couple years ago, it was all the rage called data is the new oil. Right. But to a certain extent, especially for those uh, companies like Google and Facebook and others that were early into the data gathering and aggregation. Um, it did allow them to have this first mover uh, advantage that allowed them to significantly corner the market on these things before there were any like laws or outside structures that allowed for a actual exchange to happen. Um, yeah. And it's kind of like this thing that people didn't know that they had this thing that they were giving up. And so the argument that they're like, oh, well, that was you know, the, the tacit agreement that you give up every time that you use any of these things. Um, I feel like we're, we're run into that. Um, I guess we talked about it earlier, the asymmetric knowledge problem. Right, People had no right. idea what they were giving up yeah. when they were actually doing this. And without full understanding of the situation, they couldn't make an informed choice. You know, it's so interesting. That means that they'll oh. make the correct choice, but at least they would have the full information. 
In in Europe, we see a different attitude towards this, right? With the right to be forgotten on Google and um, you know laws about what you have to disclose in terms of your data gathering uh, for for any sort of websites. But it's but it also seems sort of like. Um, and it maybe shouldn't seem like this, like the David versus Goliath thing, you know, or, or almost like whack-a-mole if we want to use another thing. Um, the European governments that do that are better about educating their citizens about rights they ought to have and things like that that ought to be respected. They're always like, you know, five steps behind these big tech companies. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that may be a topic that we have to come back to in another um, – another, uh, session so, right the big speaking tech of i think we should yeah well i think we should really circle back to our, our main topic here truth yeah and how even within a you know it is important because of the technology that we have that certain things become much more difficult to understand or to to uh assess as true or false yeah right yeah so so truth um this is something we talked about a lot in the last uh several sessions um we we talked about different theories of truth and how to understand it and you know truth is not just a purely theoretical or speculative matter or something to idealize it's something that we really do need almost like we need air you know or um shelter or or sustenance Uh, living without truth is or living in a in a you could say a communicative domain in which you can never be sure what's true or what's false. That's really tough on people. And so, um, you know, there are different ways in which we try to get at it. There's some areas in, in philosophy, you know, epistemology, uh, the word for, for, uh, epistemology, episteme is, it means knowledge, but the domain is also very concerned with what makes things true. How do we know that things are true? Logic, you know, the main reason we do logic is to be able to tell the true apart from the false and to be able to determine whether arguments lead us to truth or lead us away from, from truth. And there's, there's other, you know, there's other domains or, or disciplines like dialectic or, rhetoric, communication, all of these have to do with shaping or leading us to discovering, communicating, even how to contest uh, truth. And so this brings us to, you know, we we said the topic here was going to be the marketplace of ideas. This is a very, very popular image that uh, people throw around. And, you know, we should think first, well, what is an actual marketplace? Is is it the agora in ancient Greece where people would go and buy and sell? A lot of us don't really go to the agora to do our shopping these days. We go to particular stores or I don't know if, you, if you're like me, you tend to buy things more online and, and have other people shop for you and put it into nice packages and send it up to you, right? Um, and, and so... You know, there's there's a lot of different kinds of marketplaces. We could think about everything from very structured places where you never get to haggle uh, and everybody's got their particular place to the bazaar where, you know, you're expected to bargain with people. And you may talk about asymmetric knowledge problems, right? You, mm-hmm. you might not know what's in the booth next next door to you where the better bargain might be. And why? So it's clearly not that kind of marketplace that we're talking about. What what kind of marketplace is the marketplace of ideas supposed to be? It, it seems more like the metaphor is of the marketplace of classical economics. You know, of Adam Smith saying that um, you know if you charge too much or you provide bad service or you don't um, you know stand by your product or you cheat people, you're going to be driven out of the market. And if you provide people good quality for what they're willing to pay, you satisfy their desires in ways that they can go along with, well, then you're going to prosper and you will have more and more of your kind of thing. There's competition between different um, purveyors, different suppliers. Um, Everybody's looking to fine tune stuff. So if, if we think about truth in that way, what kind of marketplace do we get? We, we get a, a place in which people are bringing their wares, the things that they believe, the things that they want to say, the things that they value. They're putting them on the table and they're seeing if other people will pick them up. 
And if other people do pick them up, well, then there's kind of a, a transaction that takes place. But it's also a replication. If, if I manage to convince Dan of something that he doesn't believe right now, uh, he'll go around and tell other people about that thing. Right. Maybe I, it, well, everyone should wear an anti Leviathan T-shirt. Um, you know, Dan doesn't believe that right now because he's not wearing one. But maybe I convince him by the end of this and then he becomes an anti Leviathan T-shirt evangelist. <laughs> um, that's that's You know, the, the truth in, in, down to Hobbes. Yeah, well, the the truth becomes something, if we really are thinking in these terms of marketplaces, the truth then becomes something that's not just a commodity that you buy and sell, it's something that you reproduce. And the the things that are true should become, you know, the the norm. Hmm. That's the ideal. Right. Um, does it work like that? So, just like there is this issue within... Um, economics and the whole idea of um, uh, homo economicus, okay. which is the, the, the idealized human that is perfectly rational. And when they go into the market, they will uh, try to maximize their um, what they get for the what like money that they get mm -hmm. they have um, as they enter into the market. And um, but as we know, humans aren't purely rational. Um, and we have a lot of biases, and you see this over and over with people, you know, buying things that are just <laughs> totally like from charlatans. Yeah. I remember, like uh, a couple years ago, both the the shake weight as well as the thing that you would wear on your ab that shocked your abs are supposed to get you uh, <laughs> fit without having to do anything. All these things prey on these ideas of like, oh, people want to get fit, but they don't actually want to do the work or cut down on the eating that would actually get that would give them the results. Yeah. Um, you know, it, they they want to maximize their output for their input. That's interesting. And, are are there equivalents like that with ideas where people buy into ideas, truths, opinions, right? Um, that are too reductive, that are oversimplified, that are crap products, and, and, and you could say, when they really ought to be, they really ought to be looking for something that that's more substantive that will improve their life. I would say absolutely. I think there's a lot of them. They're everywhere. Okay. And um, I guess I would say that there's a lot of that in um, a lot of religions that they will sometimes say like oh well instead of you know de depending on the religion obviously mm -hmm. but like instead of like saying i want to investigate a thing and try to figure out why it's true or not you just say like oh well that that is god yeah and, or, and or you this stop is the, being, this is what we believe right yeah and you have to take it on faith yeah and, and which are things that i i kind of i very much oppose uh, I'm very much in like the skeptical sense of I, I want to keep on digging, digging. But if there's anything that puts up a wall and says you shouldn't be looking into this any further, that that makes me feel very uncomfortable. And I, I feel like those are, are often ideas that prevent us from actually arriving at truths. Yeah. Uncomfortable in the sense of like you you feel like there's something underhanded, something hinky going on uncomfortable in the sense of like i don't like that that they're you're doing the wrong thing by saying this what, what what mode of uncomfortability are we talking about specifically like you know one's beliefs usually leads to one's actions and okay if someone believes something is good um for someone told you or you have to take this on faith um it, it can thus result in really negative things. And I guess this is, you know, we're going to talk about her a little bit later, but like uh, Hannah Arnett and, and the banality of evil and the whole, like, oh, he's just doing his job. Like he, he's told us like, well, he wants to improve his numbers. And so he's going to make sure that his spreadsheet works out well in the end, but yeah. it doesn't actually take into the account of what are the actual consequences to other people of getting your numbers up like and, that. And once what, you remove yourself. What's the spreadsheet actually measuring if we're talking about an Eichmann? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, I was kind of thinking in, in terms of like, um, you know, there, there's a lot of people, 
and we'll expand this. So there's a lot of people in, in religious communities. There's a lot of people in political communities. Um, there's a lot of people selling things economically. I would even say there's a lot of people in education itself who are trying to purvey to us half truths at best, you know, sort of like um, things that, that contain some true aspects, but are clearly oversimplifications of, I, and this used to drive me nuts because I'm the kind of person, like if I, if I'm listening to somebody talk about, you know, what happened historically, I want the, I want what I think to be the real story, right? Which oftentimes I'm wrong about that. It's way more complicated <laughs> even than that. But, but I, but I know that the thing that they're telling me is BS, you know, it's, it's been, um, some, sanitized yeah sanitized or it's, it's it's just been whittled away until it becomes something nice and easy to convey in a few sentences you know like something you can have on a plaque um and and you know it, it's interesting because um as somebody who you know works in philosophy but also works in religious studies and is, is you know read read quite, quite a few things I will encounter, to go back to religion, I will encounter um, religious people who try to tell me what the tenets of their faith are. And I'm like, I think in my mind, well, I know that's wrong. You know, this person claims to be an ex, but an ex actually, according to their own doctrines, you know, thinks this or this is the history or, or stuff like that. And so when, when they tell me things that are oversimplified or, or sometimes even just false, um, for me, that that does sort of set alarm bells off, and I'm like, why is this person? What are they trying to get out of um, telling me something that that isn't true? I'll, I'll give you an example in in, in um, something that has to do with philosophy and religion. So, there never was within the the Catholic Church any official philosophy or philosopher. You will get a lot of people both. Um, anti-religious and sort of benighted Catholics telling you Thomas Aquinas's philosophy is the official Catholic philosophy. It's never been the case. And we know this because some papal encyclicals actually say that, that there is no official Catholic philosophy, including the most recent you know, one by John Paul II, Fide Se Ratio, right? So you run into people and they're telling you this line and you're like, well, I know that's not right. I may not actually know what the truth is. I know that this person doesn't have the truth, and I and I do have. I can say this is a true statement that that person's lying to me, or that person's um, deceived, or that person is um, mistaken, right? Mm-hmm. So you, you don't you don't fully have the truth at at your disposal. Um, but they're very confident usually when, when they say these sorts of things. And, and it can be about products, you know, oh, you know, if you buy a Subaru now, you'll have it 20 years, you know, and you'll be able to send it down to your kids, which is what those Subaru commercials are all about. And I'm a Subaru owner, you know, so I, I think Subarus are, are a good, you know, a, a good car to have. But you look at those commercials and you're like, this is mostly like lies. <laughs> you know? Right. So. Um, so, I, I'd like to bring this back to the, the marketplace. The marketplace, uh, yeah. exactly um, that you know, within the marketplace there are are lots of different strategies to get people to buy things, and so all is if you're looking at a, a purely like one to one argument of like trying to make this a marketplace, okay, then uh, we as these biased individuals that like fall into you know the bandwagon effect or like self-serving biases all the time yeah um and it's really hard for you to not like for example uh danny kahneman who wrote uh thinking fast and slow it's all about human biases so it's like yeah i spent most of my life doing these biases i still fall into them yeah because just knowing them doesn't automatically inoculate you to these bad ways of thinking and that results in us if we're just going to go oh well you know the the cream will rise to the top if everyone throws out things uh i would say like the cream doesn't always rise to the top in in markets as well there there are so many times where where things go out and and are self-replicating um especially as ideas yeah um and and especially if you've got an idea um 
take an ideology that has a part of it that you can't question the ideology that is um, built in defense mechanisms for you to try to not actually invest, investigate that particular ideology. That would be particularly uh, problematic in a marketplace, right? Because you would have, it, it's sort of like a product that is being sold and then, well, we have products like this. You're not allowed to repair it yourself or to look right. at its inner workings. Inner workings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. You know, um, what happens when you do that? You void the warranty, which is a contract that says that uh, if, if something's wrong with our product, you know, God forbid something should not work right. Um even though they know that's going to happen statistically a certain number of times, we will we will make it good. We will like you know after we've made you jump through a bunch of hoops, we will um, supply you a new product or something like that. Um, right. Yeah, that you know if you think about a lot of the products that we have these days, you know it used to be that you could work on your car. And you can still work on your car. AutoZone exists, right? And you can go and buy um, diagnostic computers to let you do the things that are connected with that. But there's not an awful lot you can easily do with the tools that you would have needed 30 years ago um, to work on a car. You know, I, I remember having the experience at one point in time. I was just going to change some brake pads. This was this was back in the 1990s, and I had you know a Pontiac. 6,000. Uh, I think, a, you know, car that's long since never, not, not been made. And I had it jacked up. I was out on the street and I had, I bought the brake pads and I go to look at things and it required tools that I didn't have. Tools that you wouldn't, a lot of people now do have those star wrenches. That's what it needed. Yeah. Torques. Yeah. Yeah. But that was not yeah. common at the time. And it was one of those sort of like in-your-face examples of you cannot mess with the, the product. Go take it to somebody who can. And so I think the you know you can't question the ideology, or you you can only go so far with it. Is sort of like that in in an, um, a mechanical uh, way, right? Or um, ideologies in which if you stray from the ideology, then. Uh, Oh, repercussions are taken against you. And yeah. So I think of um, certain religions that will like uh, extra uh, what uh, disfellowship and or uh, excommunicate yeah, yeah. Um, you because you, you you did something that was outside or you started questioning the teachings that are given there. And so now you're not like truth isn't the barometer that your barometer is. Um, am I going to be able to maintain the relationships with my friends and my family? Do I need to, um, what do I need to do in order to maintain those? And yeah. we're like a social species. And so it's, that's a very strong motivator for us to not question certain things if the consequences of them are so dire. That's actually a great segue into something I was wanting us to kick around so in a, in a marketplace, ideally, and they, these never exist, right, um, all the transactions can be carried out basically at the same time for the same cost. There's no, like, hidden things attached to it. But that's not the way that real marketplaces work. And so it, in terms of a marketplace of ideas, like what you're saying is there, there are some cases where if you even suggest an idea, you're going to pay a cost for that. Uh, it's not it's not so simple as well you know because john stuart mill said we should all be able to express our opinions we all get to express our opinions if you do express certain opinions you will be ostracized or people will start looking at you or it'll be more difficult to get people to take you seriously the next time around um and there's there's a lot of cases where to get access to uh what is true or even just you know the information we would need to be better informed about what's what's true and what's false. We have to pay a lot, or it may not be available to us at all. Maybe somebody came in and cornered that market, you know? Right. What are what are? Um, oh, go ahead. Oh, please. What was your question? I was going to say. So, what are some of these transaction costs that are 
unfair? What would be examples of that within the marketplace of ideas, hopefully leading to truth, but but perhaps not leading to that? You know, why why do we why do we settle for shoddy products rather than the high end stuff? You know. Well, I guess you know part of it is that we're we're all born into families, and okay. families usually have certain ideas. Um, and we are given this like basket of goods automatically that are our base ideas, right? Yeah. And um, you know, to take uh, what is that? Uh, either sunk cost fallacy. It's like, oh well, I, I've been I've been believing these things all my time, all my life. Um, like these are now a part of me. These are some things that I I can even like base my whole personality or all my whole worldview upon. Yeah. And any point in time that I might swap out one of these um, things. I need to have to have a reconciliation with all of what those the consequences of me swapping out this idea. If this is a really foundational idea, so I don't know. Um, maybe uh, the question of like free will, yes or no. Like if I'm going to change my position on that, that that has all potentially a lot of consequences yeah. for how I'm going to act in my own life as well as the uh, things that I would expect from other people exactly, and the, yeah. the judgments I would make about them. Yeah, and you know, I'm thinking about like people who they hold on to ideas almost like hoarders hold on to um, physical objects as goods because they're connected with you know somebody who's who's gone somebody who's not even in the picture i i can't change this point of view because that's my connection to my grandma you know or some some other strongly uh developed relationship you know, it could be a teacher could be a coach could be who knows i think there's there's a lot of people who suffer in in that kind of situation Yeah. Uh, and so we had to then ask, like, what what is the reason that we should believe things versus mm-hmm. yeah, this is kind of like what we talked about the last couple weeks and like what are the basis for truth? Yeah. Um, and I, I would say that that, you know, it's nice that you want to have this connection, but it is not a, a basis by which truth can be yeah. derived. Yeah, that's quite that. That's very good. And then you know, if you have kids of your own, or I don't know, if you, like if you're in education, right? You have your pupils, your students are kind of like your kids in a way, because you're transmitting something to them. If you're stuck in a wrong-headed, unjustified way of looking at the world, or at least certain topics, you're going to inevitably inevitably pass that on to them. You know. Um, and so the, you could say maybe there's a duty to extricate oneself from from those things. Coming back to the to, to the market, though, I mean, can we can we frame that in terms of market failures? Uh, you know, we have inefficient markets. Um, mm-hmm. We have perverse markets. Like, uh, okay. what we, like what we had. Like think of um, some of these ideas or ideologies that like kind of suck you in and stick you mm-hmm. and think of like a, um, a company town where you have to buy from the company oh, store. Yeah. And I feel like that's a good analogy between like, Oh, well it's a, it's supposedly a market, but one person controls it. And if you don't do that, um, your entire livelihood is um, at, at risk. Yeah. And maybe, maybe that of the survival of your family as well, the, the other things right. you hold dear. It's interesting, too, because in those company towns, those are set up in such a way that you never, you never get ahead. You never get out of debt. You're, you're buying company products. You're paying com- you know, rent for the house that you're living in. And you never make enough to actually get anywhere. Is there an equivalent like that in terms of truth and knowledge uh, maybe the labor that you're doing is replicating the ideology, right? And you can never get yourself to the point where you wouldn't have to do that anymore, right? You could successfully move to another place and have your own your own domain, or you would retire and you know not have to uh, 
um, spout the company line anymore. Mm. I, I think we could say that there are a lot of cases like that. Yeah, I could definitely, like, the easiest go-to are, like, certain cults in which, like, uh, everything is for the greater good of this, of either the prophet or the, you know, the leader, and we're all going to have some, you know, incredible uh, reward that we we'll have in some sort of afterlife, um, and to, uh, to totally discard everything that we have here in the, the physical world in order to try to make sure that we are good with that, yeah. you know, eventual, uh, reward. And yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, cults are, you're, I think you're right, are a good example of that. Totalitarian societies, as Hannah Arendt pointed out, have a similar dynamic in the erosion of like the, what we can call the, the value of truth or the distinction between truth and falsity or um, facts and, and, and fiction. And I wonder if we can say that something like that occurs in seemingly more free environments where a person is still in large part deprived of truth. So if you think about um, consumerism and, you know, the notion that you're, you're made happy by basically making a lot of money and buying the best stuff and, you know, consuming it, enjoying it, all of that. You, you know, when people live that sort of lifestyle, they're often not happy except at particular moments. They bought the new product, they spent some money, you know, they did what they call retail therapy, and they're happy for, for a short space, and then they're not happy because that's that's not really where you're going to find any sort of lasting happiness. So then you can say, well, why the hell are they doing it? What's are, are they masochists? You know, do they just want to be unhappy? Or, you know, where are they, what is holding them in place? And then you say, well, you know, tons and tons of, you know, marketing and advertisement and everybody else around them behaving in the same way, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not a totalitarian society. It's actually got a lot of freedom. I mean, you can get as many different kinds of spaghetti sauce as you want. Going, you know, going to Pick and Save or Metro Mart, right? Uh, I don't know if you've ever walked down the, the one in, in, in Shorewood. There's like an entire aisle almost for spaghetti sauce, right? And I felt like I got vertigo the last time I walked down the <laughs> spaghetti sauce aisle. Yeah. Now, if, if your life revolves around the prestige spaghetti sauce or getting the best bargain or pick whatever other consumerist value, um, I think that. You, you not only are you buying into some things that are that are false in place of things that are true about say human nature some philosophical or psychological um, uh, opinions or, or judgments but it's going to lead you inevitably to um, mistaking truth for falsity in other other ways right um, the way in which you approach other people the the way in which you decide what matters for yourself um, and that's just one example. I think we could have other examples where a person is not in a cult or a totalitarian society, but the distinction between truth and falsity is kind of getting eroded. You know, I think the political arena is becoming, um, especially on social media, becoming like that in, in our, our present day, you know, when the main motivation for a lot of people seems to be to own the, own the libs or own the conservatives. Um, that's not truth conducive, right? No. That's cutting off one's nose to spite one's face. Uh, you know, it, like, we are still a, a polis together, at least as you know, the United, United States, and we're, yeah, we're, we're kind of stuck together. Creating, yeah, and if we're, we're creating a narrative in which you know, a, a large portion of the population is your enemy. Um, then it's only going to tear us down to the, I guess, the, the betterment of another country that might yeah. consider, want to create and so discord. You know, along with that, though, in terms of truth, is um, so the other the other people become the enemy for however they're construed, right? Mm -hmm. What can you count on an enemy to do to lie to you to um, to deliberately? 
um, downplay whatever's true about them and, and you know, um, put out other things that are untrue and try to try to infect you with untruth as well. And especially, you know, not just you, but your community, your kids, your workplace, whatever it would happen to to be. Um, and that's that's a very, you know, uh, strong stance against not just the other person as being a bad person, but a, as being corrosive of truthfulness. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to... So, going to the the marketplace again, mm-hmm. like, this, this whole idea of kind of like the cream's going to rise to the top, but this is really, you know, the, the ad populum fallacy. Whatever happens to be popular is is the good thing within a market yeah yeah um but that is not a uh a valid reasoning stance for actually coming to the truth um with that said i i do like is like this idealized idea of what like the market should be mm-hmm. um does have at least one thing that i'll i'll benefit this uh, analogy as okay. a marketplace of ideas of the the free flow of information yeah that that people can present ideas um to to the masses in order for them to kind of uh, mull them over i guess the problem this is i guess that a lot of people don't have the full skills to objectively try to um, inquire into the truth of these ideas, yeah, yeah. Uh, and and there's you know advertising and rhetoric all around to try to work on people's natural proclivities to these biases that we have to get them to believe things um, for bad reasons. Yeah, and and so I I think like in this idealized thing of hey we're we're like you're going to the forum and you're going to make a speech and everyone's got like a background in in rhetoric so they know when when people are trying to swindle them by by uh making arguments towards like emotion or or, or, or to to biases yeah this this sounds like a really great you know way of doing things and and maybe this I guess this kind of comes off a little bit uh, elitist, but like, not everyone has the time or the um, the opportunity to be fully informed of how to work through a syllogism, um, yeah. or to to work through what are fallacious arguments or not. And if you you just throw things out there and get people to agree with them for bad reasons, that the outcome of this marketplace isn't truth. It's just, you know, ad popular effect. Yeah. That's, I think that that's, uh, that's often what does happen. Um, I think we can also talk about there being some, you know, the marketplace sounds like it's, you know, each, each person has the same capacity to get other people to listen to them. And we know that's not, not the case. You know, corporations have way, way more money than, well, than most individual people. There are some super rich people who, who also have that, but let's say corporations and super rich people have uh, way more money that can amplify their message and drown out the messages of other people that, that they don't want to be heard than all the rest of us, right? And so, you know, is it really a fair marketplace of ideas if you've got one guy with a giant megaphone uh, and another guy who has to like talk through, I don't know, he's got to like talk through like a thing that that de-intensifies the signal. Um, It it strikes me as as clearly uh, unfair and, and, you know, biased towards those who are going to use that to, to improve their position within the marketplace of ideas. And we can talk about other kinds of prestige. Like if you're a Harvard professor, as opposed to somebody at, at UWM, you've got a bigger mouthpiece as well, just by virtue of that name, even though you might be a complete dummy that just happened to get in and the, the UWM professor might be brilliant. Um, you know, sometimes these things do even out. It's not to say that like money or social status dominates everything, but I do think we have to take account of that. In talking about this marketplace, um, it's clearly not a um, 
fairly set up marketplace, the way that, that its proponents talk, the way that they present it, you know. This reminds me of um, an out-of-context situation, which okay. is coined by um, Ian Banks uh, in the Culture Series, talking about um, an out-of-context situation is, is what happens when you've got a, a really nice thriving island nation, and all of a sudden there's these nice... Uh, white sails that show up on the horizon and some guys come out with these uh these sticks that they can point at you and they they kill you dead and and so there's there's no context in the current technological advancement of this particular tribe yeah to what the hell is going on here and um and so i make this analogy to the you know, the difference between like uh, even us, or just you know, some guy on the street that's going to want to enter into this, you know, marketplace for ideas, as as this this guy basically as the the the, the nice islander, um, and and a corporation that's got like an advertising firm and psychologists uh, yeah, yeah. and and uh, armies of people that are all trying to in coordination, um, using a lot greater technology. Um, and reach in order to totally bowl over this other person. It doesn't matter if one person is right or not, yeah. just that the the sheer force that is brought to bear is overwhelming. Yeah, I think that's that 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 is a good analogy. Um, <clears throat> and they may even like suck in that person and and uh, subvert their message so it becomes part of their greater message. Um, and and it's unfortunate, you know. A lot of people say, "Oh, I'm not going to be moved by advertising. Money doesn't really do that much." But we know that it does. You know, looking at at how elections go, or looking at how advertising campaigns for you know consumer good products work. As a matter of fact, a, a significant portion of non generic foodstuffs is the packaging and the, the advertisement. That's that's part of what separates your, you know, brand name from your generic stuff, which is often the same product. So made in the same factory at the same day, and they just changed out the packaging. Yeah. So um Early, you know, at the very beginning, I said I was a little bit pessimistic. Actually, not a little bit, pretty pessimistic about <laughs> our contemporary situation. Um, you know, I think there's some factors that that go into that that we could talk about that make our era a bit more difficult than previous ones. And you know, one of them is is the 24 hour news cycle, which we now take for granted. I mean, you talk just a little bit earlier. You talked about the free flow of information, which we do see as a good thing, right? Uh, especially now that we have the internet, and there's so many places that you can go, and there's even great sites that like you know keep people from being able to like take down stuff, like the Wayback Machine, so that mm-hmm. people can't just. Um, obliterate the the truth of the the bad stuff that they wrote right we can actually get public record to that but we are really inundated with um you know maybe there's too much information and it and it's constantly coming at us how are how are we able to discern what's true and what's false when we're like you know, by the time that we figure out that this thing is true, there's five more. It's sort of like having an inbox, right? Where mm-hmm. we used to have physical inboxes. And as you finish one report on something and you put it in your outbox, five more have been placed in your inbox. And you're like, all right, I'll get on the next one. And you pull that one out. And by the time you get done with that one, five more are stacked up. And now you got nine in your inbox. Sometimes it, it feels like that. Um, in terms of trying to stay on top of everything. And then there's the opposite thing where people realize they can't stay on top of it and they feel like, well, how, how would I know what's true or false given that I'm not, you know, cognizant of half the, well, not even half, I'm, I'm not even cognizant of a, a sliver of, of what's going on around me. How can I know what's true? I mean, what, what's your, do, do you have a feeling like that? Or, um, I, I don't, I guess I don't have a a problem. I guess my foundation a lot of times is looking at a lot of peer reviewed studies. Okay, so this is the thing I've gotten. That to, seems like, time past. consuming though, too. It is. <laughs> it is to actually dig into these things. And I, like I know that, like to a certain extent, I'm I'm um, I'm missing things because 
sometimes I'll be reading things that are totally outside mm-hmm. of my area of expertise. Um, but at least I know that there is some checks and balances in these things of being something that is peer reviewed. Yeah. And so it has greater clout than just some guy who's out there <laughs> putting up a website. Tap, I can put away, up a web- yeah, yeah like, I, I can put up a, a website in an hour and put up whatever the heck I want. Um, just because there's a website out there doesn't mean that's true. It's like, yeah. I think this is one of those things that we, we used to have the ability to just go, oh, something is printed. It takes a lot of time and money, and there's a barrier to entry to actually put these things in print. And so it was a, you know, um, a shorthand, a heuristic, a bi- uh, uh, you know, a cognitive bias to say, oh, well, it's, it's print in print, and therefore it's, it's more likely to be true than not. Which, you know, with the whole idea of, like, yellow journalism in the, yeah. the early 1900s probably throws it out. But people were like, at least there was less chance you get total crackpot ideas. Yeah, yeah. You might have, like, politically motivated ideas, but it wasn't usually totally off the deep end. Yeah. Um, but nowadays, the, the, the barrier to entry is so low that anyone can go out and put up whatever you want, and thus you can have anyone... Um, you know, one of the, our, our biases is these um, self-serving biases or the um, uh, confirmation bias that we, we go out and we look for the things right. that confirm our, our hypothesis and we discount anything that says otherwise. And because there is such a low barrier to entry, anything is out there, you can find something to support your idea wherever. And so you, you see this with the, the, like the rise in the flat earthers, which used to be you know, a very really hard group. to yeah 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 it used to be really hard to find one of these guys now you've given them a, a, a forum where they can all gather and all reference their own stuff and they, they've created this little community for each other you know this reminds me of something that I I, I put in front of a few of my colleagues um, years and years ago when the internet was becoming a, a you know big thing in the early two uh, thousands. And I was I was thinking how it eroded, what would we call it? Um, you know, vi- we'll call it violations of social norms. So, like, if you were into something really niche and and kind of inconsequential, like co- you know, collecting Beanie Babies or something like that, which actually isn't going to say tricky. Actually, not that that niche because people were like using them as a form of currency but but it was kind of a minority thing okay the internet probably made it easier for you to connect with people you could go on you know buy on ebay you know this this one or that one or you could like go and find out what the catalog was and all that so that's cool right it created a kind of community if you were into something that was really skeevy um you generally, before the internet, unless you had like a peer group that was equally skeevy, you kept it to yourself because right. people would be like, you're a creep. Get out of here. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. But once the internet you know, exploded with chat rooms and forums and all these sorts of things, well, you could, you could be the one person in your town who was into something really sketchy. And then you could find 50 other people within hours who are like, oh, no, man, it's not you. It's society. It's all those squares. And you're, you know, you're one of us and, and we're a community. And, you know, this is just as, as good as anybody else. And then that would reinforce you. And then, and then you know, it would, things would, would come out. And now I kind of think there's probably a lot of things that were at that time considered um, violations of social norms in the United States that have you know, um, been eroded that way that it turned out to be a good thing, like, you know, drug legalization. There's there's some drugs that we probably should legalize. Um, there's plenty that we, we should keep under, you know, very close surveillance still, I think, uh, that, that are quite bad for people. Um, and it allowed people to communicate back and forth outside of high times. That's probably <laughs> good, right? But there's a lot of things where where the baser tendencies of people have been fostered and encouraged. And, you know, I know one of the things we were going to talk about is echo chambers. And I think the inter- it's not as if echo chambers didn't exist before the internet, but they've certainly proliferated in, in that. And that has a deleterious effect on, on truth because once you're in one of these chambers, you mentioned all these different kinds of biases. 
they're they're rife with that, right? And those are going to stand in the way not only of attaining truth, but even seeing that you're not attaining truth and that we're, what you've got isn't the truth, you know? So right. I, I think the, the idea, <laughs> I wanted to bounce off of you. Do you think the internet did that? Do you think that that... Or, or should we say, well, it's not the internet that did that. Human nature was like that before the internet. Um, it's just a little bit worse uh, now. You know? It enabled it. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and unfortunately, um, it also enables like some of the, the worst things. And so I was thinking about like when you're saying like the, uh, there's a guy that's got some skeevy ideas. Um, Yes, uh, and, and you've got like two sets of skeevy ideas. Okay, uh, one set of skeevy ideas that make you money, and so like like maybe we're gonna be trafficking drugs or whatnot, which is a skeevy idea, but also it's very profitable, and so you get okay, enough yeah, people yeah. that are are wanting to make that, so you can you can create those organizations, and so you've got like criminal organizations, which you know proliferated before the internet as well. Yeah, but you and then you had skeevy ideas that were just like really really negative and so for example like like the worst thing that co- that immediately pops in your mind is like child pornography yeah and how those um because of both the gathering ability and the at least pseudo anonymity that the internet provides it allows people that would be you know totally unable to ever even approach this topic um because they would have been like totally you know, ostracized from their community for even bringing it up to find those few other people that yeah, yeah. also have that same proclivity and can say and, you're the normal one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a, that's an interesting example. Um, I was thinking more in terms of like, you know, viewing again going back to politics, viewing the other side as like these these horrible enemies who are just absolutely trying to erode everything that the country stands for and, and we need to like be willing to use force against them. Now I, I think there's been it's not as if we didn't have that we had a civil war before, you know, and we had lots and lots of conflict before, but I think the internet um exacerbates that. Yeah, I, I see people like calling like just large portions of our, our country like evil, and I really have a problem with that because it's like are we are we not at least to a certain extent connected to each other? And if, if we we just deem people evil, how is that actually bringing us to a point where we can have some sort of reconciliation so, potentially? So when we have stuff like that going on, can we actually talk about a marketplace of ideas like in in politics, or is that is that metaphor just no longer really apt? Once you see someone as the enemy, like the the free flow of information dies because the first thing, what is it, uh, the first thing to go in war is truth? That's right. So that's, that's a good pithy statement. And uh, we probably need to go out on another good pithy statement about truth yes. as well. So we leave you today with the words of Hannah Arnett. When we talk about lying... Let us remember that the lie did not creep into politics by some accident of human sinfulness. Moral outrage, for this reason alone, is not likely to make it disappear.